spending part of what day is it? Wednesday with us. Time is slippery these days. We're so excited to have you here and to share out what we've been cooking up with an initiative that we call Democracy Day. And this is no, um, you know, no coincidence that we're doing it on September 15th, 2022, because that is actually the International Day of Democracy. So it's not something we made up, it's just something we're using as a good old fashioned news peg to help newsrooms prepare for the threats to democracy and, and let the public know about them as well. So I'm Jennifer Brandel, I'm the co-founder of Harkin and also Democracy SOS and Election SOS. And I'm working along with an amazing consortium of people who are all volunteering to try and put together a call to action for newsrooms, which is to publish something or broadcast something about democracy on September 15th, so that your audiences and your communities know about the threats to democracy, who is doing what in terms of trying to help those things, and ultimately to sound the alarm. Because if you haven't been paying attention, and I'm sure you have, which is why you're here, um, we're really in a crisis moment. And so today we're really lucky to have with us a couple of folks who are going to share a bit more from their perspective and their vantage points about why this matters, why we are doing this. And then we're gonna share out a whole variety of great examples to get your inspiration juices flowing as you think about how might your newsroom participate in Democracy Day. We also wanna say, we don't think you should just do coverage about the threats to democracy on one day. Many newsrooms, as you've probably seen, have made this into an entire beat. They're hiring reporters on this front. It doesn't just have to be one moment that you're doing this work, but we do want to have a concerted effort on the 15th of September to really sound the alarm collectively across the country and provide a lot of great coverage for the public to understand what is at stake here. So without Further ado, I want to introduce Michael Bolden, who is the CEO of the American Press Institute, to share his answers to this question, these two questions. Why are we doing this and why does democracy matter? So over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks, Jen, and thanks everybody for joining us today. You know, uh, when my father was alive, he and I didn't talk much about his service in the US Army. Uh, it seemed so distant to me, and most of my adult memories are about him living as a retired grandfather and minister, not about something that had happened decades before I was even thought of. But dad was buried six years ago with military honors, uh, standing at my daddy's grave, listening to a soldier playing taps. I missed him, but I felt proud of him, and I reflected on what our democracy had meant to this man. Earlier this year, I found a digital copy of his World War II draft card. It confirmed that he had lied about his age to join the service, saying he was two years older than he was. Here was a man who grew up poor under Jim Crow laws, who faced segregation and humiliation dealing with systemic racism every day, yet he felt compelled to join the service to fight for this country's supposed ideals. He lived in the deepest South, Mobile County, Alabama, where whites only signs and racist violence were part of life, yet he believed in democracy. George Washington called the creation of the American government the last great experiment for promoting human happiness by reasonable compact in civil society. It was an experiment my dad took seriously. He read and listened to reports about that experiment being under threat from autocrats around the world. As I grew up, I saw that my father approached the idea of our representative democracy with reverence. He believed in voting. I don't think he ever missed an election, but he also believed in being informed. He knew that the media, we journalists, were an important link with the information he needed to do what he believed was his duty as a citizen. As a child, I often went out to the front yard to get the paper for him, and daddy would settle into his recliner to read the latest news from South Alabama and around the world. He paid attention to each page, often with broadcast news playing on the television across the room. He lived the reality of the imperfection of our country, but he lived in hope that the ultimate outcome of the United States of America was worth the investment of his time and attention, and if need be, his life. In creating the International Day of Democracy in 2007, the United Nations described democracy as a universal value based on the freely expressed will of people to determine their own political, economic, social, and cultural systems, and their full participation in all aspects of life. My father believed in that full participation, and he believed in the work that each of you do to help people like him participate in our society. Yes, it is our democracy that gives us all the freedom to do our work. The 1776 Virginia Declaration of Rights stated, the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty, 
and can never be restrained but by despotic governments. And we see despots and potential despots at work around the world trying to do that. We see that happening now in Russia where any semblance of a free press has been shut down so that people don't have access to information about what is really happening in Ukraine and in their own country. We see it in the Philippines where Rappler has been ordered to shut down, where the government doesn't want people to be informed to be able to fully participate in their society. We have seen the growth of lies and misinformation to influence people's participation for the benefit of personal political gain here in our own country. The most recent Press Freedom Index from Reporters Without Borders shows that journalism is blocked, impeded, or constrained in almost 75% of the countries it examined. And while press freedom in the US was labeled fairly good, we only ranked 44th, with what was cited as a record number of assaults and arrests of members of the media threatening our work. Our work matters because freedom of the press is not guaranteed. Democracy is not guaranteed. It requires our work. It requires our participation and the participation of each of us as residents, as well as journalists. Many of us though, we look around and we say, of course we must care about democracy. We don't think there is a need to explain. But what we forget is that much of our journalism often doesn't reflect the perspectives and the sensibilities and the realities of many people in our country. There are people in entire communities who have seen what is supposed to be democracy, ignore them, or even actively work against them. They are beyond being critical. They are indifferent. They have written off the role of democracy in their lives. They have written off the role of much of the media in their lives, but we can't write them off and we can't write off our responsibility to them and to try to maintain our great experiment. At the American Press Institute, we believe that for democracies to thrive, people need accurate news and information about their communities, the problems with our society, and the debates over how to solve them. However, we know American confidence in elections, institutions, and the media continues to weaken over time. Just look at the latest information from Pew or Gallup. This even manifests in a lack of confidence that the American people have in themselves to make decisions under our representative system of government. People need us. With important elections on the horizon, we here at API see an immediate need to help local news organizations forge stronger relationships with their communities through better reporting and deeper listening that will improve coverage for 2022 and beyond. We must shore up trust and engagement among communities everywhere, but especially with communities of color. While substantive change can take a lot of time and energy, we've seen time and again how even small grants of a few thousand dollars can help news organizations get unstuck from the status quo in coverage or business approaches. In recent years, we've begun distributing small grants to gather insights for our mission and to help publishers and media everywhere have a reason and momentum to take steps toward doing journalism differently. We're going to do that for the upcoming elections and to help empower your work. So expect an announcement from us soon about that opportunity. Uh, it should happen right around the 1st of August. None of us can be satisfied or complacent about sounding the alarm on one day or of equipping the public with the information they need on one day. Think about the freedom you have to do your work. Think about the people who you know actively participate in our democracy, but also think about the disconnected and the disaffected. Think about the hope you bring when you tell people how our systems work or how they don't work and that they can have the power to help all of our lives change. That is the power of our democracy and that is why Democracy Day uh, is important to us. Thank you for the work you do. Uh, and we here at API are committed to helping you do that better and to serve all of our communities better. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Michael, for those profound remarks. I hope you make those public because that was really a beautiful and very depthful story that you just told, personally connecting to uh, the situation that we're all facing right now, which is the potential loss of our democracy and what that could mean. So up next, we are going to hear from Jay Rosen, who is a media critic and NYU professor. You've hopefully seen his work on the Citizens Agenda and other um, very incisive uh, critiques of the media ecosystem right now. And Knowing Jay for as long as I have, he 
critiques the media because he loves the media and he understands that if we don't do our job, the stakes are pretty severe. Um, and maybe Jay, I shouldn't have said love. You can say how you feel about the media, but you do it because you care. At the end of the day, you really care and you see the writing on the wall. So I'd like to invite Jay to give some remarks about the stakes that we face at this moment. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to give a few minutes of sort of high level remarks about the problems that we face because uh, we in the US, as Michael just suggested, are part of a global shift that scholars call democratic backsliding. It's happening around the world um, and the US is becoming one of the leaders in this dark art. Um, democratic backsliding, which is the tendency for a democratic system to um, decay, presents huge problems for journalists as they try to inform the American public. Democracy used to be a background condition of doing journalism, something that you could assume, something that made journalism possible. Its basic mechanics uh, could be relied upon, but we're now understanding that a lot of our democracy runs on a kind of honor system uh, in which informal codes of conduct and uh, political conventions held a, a lot of power because both parties agreed to them. This is especially true of the way we run elections in the United States. A huge part of running elections is the volunteers uh, and uh, other poll workers who administer the election under a code of nonpartisanship and fairness that doesn't have any legal force and doesn't have people with guns uh, assuring it. It comes out of American citizenship. Uh, and we are now seeing that under conditions of democratic backsliding, all the informal parts of the system are weak points and uh, attack services. And that's part of what we mean by a crisis of democracy is that the informal networks that kept democracy strong are decaying and sentiment is shifting in many ways against democracy. So under these conditions, uh, myself and other observers have been arguing that the American press needs to become more explicitly pro-democracy uh, as opposed to allowing it to sit in the background as a assumption or a condition. And this makes a certain amount of sense, but there's a lot of problems with this claim, which I still think is important, that journalists need to become more pro-democracy. In fact, this meeting that we're at and the uh, Democracy Day 2022 are examples of, um, of being more pro-democracy. But there are a lot of problems with that concept. Um, the first problem that I've encountered is journalists immediately say to me and others, okay, but what does that mean in practice? Which is a fair question, a really important question, but we don't necessarily know the answer to that until we get people to start experimenting with being more pro-democracy. But if the cost of experimenting is knowing in advance what does that look like in practice, then we're never going to do the experiments. So that's one of the problems. Um, another problem with, with telling journalists they need to become more pro-democracy is you immediately hear in reply, both from journalists and critics, um, that pro-democracy, that sounds like being pro-Biden, which of course is not the role of newsrooms, and nobody wants their newsroom to declare itself pro-Biden or pro-Democratic Party. Um, and so that fear of being criticized for being partisan is also one of the things in the way of putting a more pro-democracy philosophy and journalism into practice. Um, another strange problem with becoming more pro-democracy is there's a tendency in journalism to say democracy is at risk, well, we're gonna cover that. And almost every problem in journalism can be responded to that way by just adding some coverage. And so this, is, this has been one of the, re, the reflexes of the journalism profession since this backsliding started to happen, which is 
we're going to cover it as we would cover any other story. But the problem is it's not quite like any other story because it threatens the very conditions under which journalism can be transacted. Um, and that's slightly bigger than a big story or a new democracy desk, even though a democracy desk might be a really good addition to uh, your newsroom. So um, under those conditions, uh, an answer I have come to um, is that pro-democracy coverage means in part coverage that clearly shows what the stakes are in this battle for American democracy and the elections coming up where we don't know if we're gonna be able to have a free and fair election. And news coverage that more clearly and dramatically shows the stakes, what is at stake in this nest of problems that I described and that Michael just describes is I think one of the ways out of this um, puzzle of how do you get to more pro-democracy coverage until you start doing it. So make it crystal clear what the stakes are uh, seems to me to be a more muscular and effective way of doing journalism than, um, than what we've had up to now. And I, and I look forward to seeing it develop with some of the newsrooms represented in this group. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate that. And I think your remarks and the perspective you bring are really clarifying in terms of the stakes that this is not just any other big story. This is a story that threatens the, the very business of journalism itself and the role that it plays in society. So before we jump to examples and uh, next steps about Democracy Day, um, Joe Amditis, who is our amazing uh, tech guru here is going to launch a poll real quick uh, before we move on. So. If you haven't seen, if you're joining by phone, sorry, but this is the poll. We have uh, a few questions here. One, does your newsroom, does your news org currently have a democracy beat or something similar? Do you already have an idea of what kinds of coverage you'll produce for Democracy Day? How well do you feel your community understands the current threats to democracy? And what kind of support would help you participate in democracy better? So please just take a moment and answer these four questions and we will share out the results in just a moment. Okay, someone said poll came up, but then went away. I don't know, Joe, if you're able to relaunch it again or, oh, click the poll button at the bottom of the screen for Greg, it should show up. Yeah, if you still have an issue, the poll is still open. So I see people voting. We'll give it, uh, we'll give it till 1222 max, let's just say like two minutes what people are voting. There's four questions. I meant to put them all in one poll or, or on different polls, but. Uh... Thus is the Here we same are. life. Yep. <laughs> we'll get a lot of information in a short amount of time. So please take a moment and answer these questions. If you're just joining, we are doing a poll right now. If you click on polls and quizzes at the bottom of your screen, you will launch the poll. It's four questions. Okay, not seeing the poll. Carol, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom um, kind of dashboard here, it should show up next to the chat area, uh, polls and quizzes. Oh, forward on a phone. I'm sorry about that. Uh, if you're on the phone, you might not be able to do it. I'm not sure. But this will just be one more minute of dead air for you on the phone, but we'll share out what we learned. Wow, good fade in and out. <laughs> so we have a 60% participation in the poll. So thanks for everyone who's able to participate. Let's just take a moment and scroll through and see what we found here. So does your news org currently have a democracy beat or something similar? Got 22% said yes. 11% said yep, but it's not a permanent thing. 22% uh, said no, but we're working on it. And 44% said no. So next question, do you already have an idea of what kinds of coverage you'll do for Democracy Day? Um, let's say about a little more than half of the people said no, but we have something in mind or not yet, which is good news because we are going to share a bevy of examples shortly for you to uh, think about what you could do for Democracy Day. And it doesn't just have to be one story. You could do a whole huge package on it or do it throughout the whole week. It's really up to you. Question three was how well do you feel your community understands the current threats to democracy? Uh, most said basic understanding or not really. 
So we are, we're at a point where news and journalism has a real role to play here. And then you also shared a variety of ways that we could help you participate better in Democracy Day. So this is really helpful. And this will very much um, inform our efforts going forward. This is a whole volunteer effort right now. We have not been successful yet in raising money to support it. If we are this year and or next year into 2024, we have lots of incredible and big ideas um, that we uh, would like uh, to be able to do. So just so you know, if you know people who are funding this kind of work, let us know. We would love to make this a much bigger thing, but we are at this point in time doing our, our scrappy version of it and excited to have you all participate. So now I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, Rachel, from News Revenue Hub, whose tweet really launched this whole kind of situation of like, we should do a collective call to action. And she's going to talk us through the goals and start to give a few examples. Great. Um, so uh, I am uh, really happy to be here today and to see all of you. Um, so basically, we... Um, are hoping we have two sort of main goals for this effort. Uh, one is sort of external to the public and one is sort of internal uh, to media. So we really want to inform and empower the public through this information that we can give them. Um, and we also want to come together as an industry um, to expand the reach that we can have um, and the power that we can have together um, and potentially the impact from the reporting as well. So it really has this two prong approach that we're not just trying to produce reporting because we want to get better information out there, but we also really want to do this collectively. The collective approach is really important. Um, so we also want to help folks rethink um, what they mean by democracy coverage and the threats to it, um, and what is being done to protect um, democratic institutions, both on local and state um, levels, but also on the national level. Um, and then uh, going into 2022 and 2024, um, it's uh, we're really hoping to um, figure out how to do this this year so we can repeat this project again um, in the next uh, two years. Um, hold on one. Slight technical issue, folks. Hang in there. We no uh, will be right back after these short messages from our sponsors. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can read along for how to participate, which is actually fairly simple. Very simple. Sorry about that. Uh, I am not in a my house today, so um, it is uh, there's some background noise. Um, so it's very very easy to join um, this uh, collaboration. Basically, we are really all we're really asking is for folks to produce at least one story that's related to democracy and publish it or broadcast it on September fifteenth, um, and then um, and also if you have a paywall, we are hoping that you can publish it outside the paywall. Um, more than one story would be great, but one is sort of the minimum. Um, we are also uh, asking you to join on behalf of your newsroom. So we will put the name of your newsroom on um, our uh, Democracy Day page. Um, and then uh, once September 15th comes around, we are just hoping to be able to gather all of the stories that are produced so we can put them in one place um, and have them available um, on the website. Um, so it's a very straightforward um, collaboration, free, easy, um, we're trying to make the barriers to entry as low as possible. And right now, I'll just add, we have 250 newsrooms signed up so far, and we want to blow that out of the water. So we really want to get as many newsrooms across the country to participate as possible. Um, so we have a lot of ideas about what this could look like, and it really depends on what your um, what kind of newsroom you're in and what kind of audience you're producing for. But there's sort of two buckets, which are defensive and proactive, of what is actually happening on the ground in terms of um, actual threats to democracy, um, candidates who are running on, say, a Stop the Steal platform. Um, there are so many, unfortunately, examples um, that um, I'm sure you all are already reporting on that fall into this bucket um, that are really is the heart of why we wanted to do this project. At the same time, we also would love to see coverage 
of what folks are doing um, to um, protect uh, democratic institutions and candidates who are running on a platform specific to protecting uh, democracy, um, other efforts um, to protect the vote. Um, so we really would love also to see um, where possible um, and where um, resources are available to see things like solutions journalism. We have folks from the solutions journalism network um, who are part of this collaboration who could certainly help with that. Um, and so either one of these buckets or both um, is where we think folks will be able to find um, uh, a well of ideas uh, from. So we came up with uh, quite, a, well, Jen uh, came up with quite a few examples. So I'll go through a few of them and then uh, Jen will finish up with some more of them. Um, so the first is that um, the Post has done some really great coverage looking at what elected officials um, think about the 2020 election. So this is one of the more recent examples, but they also did a poll, for example, of uh, I think every member of Congress after the election to ask them uh, if they believed Joe Biden was the winner, and then they sort of published the results of that. Um, this is specific to um, the primaries and um, across the country and what whether um, election denial was part of their uh, beliefs or part of their platform. So this is a really good example of doing a really high level look um, at uh, election denial and, and how it fits in, into um, the current uh, election. Um, there are also lots of study, the political scientists um, have been hard at work. This is a an example of a paper um, that came out this summer about um, racial and geographic disparities and turnout uh, in elections. Um, so being able to dig into some of these um, academic studies and see what you can pull from there, um, either for your state or city, um, are also, there's plenty of um, opportunities there. Um, and academics are always very eager to um, uh, talk uh, to journalists and, and hopefully share um, information. So this is just one example um, to when we're thinking about academic, sort of the academic realm of where you can pull from. Um, Fantastic. And actually, yeah. on that note, um, Jenna says in the chat, speaking of academic studies, she's with the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State, where she teaches journalism, and she's happy to connect uh, to faculty experts in research, uh, research and resources to help you. So please feel free. Thank you so much, Jenna, for letting us know. That's great. Um, I'm going to give a few more examples as well and then throw it to my colleague Jessel at Solutions Journalism, but you can also, you know, cover specific threats to voting rights. This is an example um, about, you know, misleading efforts that someone is doing around ending single member districts and what that means for uh, threats to voting rights and disenfranchising voters. Um, other examples, this is something we'd be really excited to see, kind of a proactive, here's what to expect articles ahead of election day. Because a lot of people aren't necessarily seeing the writing on the wall from what happened in 2020 and what will probably naturally play out this year. So preparing your audiences that you, they should expect to see these sorts of things and whether or not they should believe them or not, report them or not, or what they can do about it. So a few examples, why you should expect to see false claims of voter fraud in the midterm elections. Write about that, let people know it's to be expected given X, Y, and Z. Also, it's normal that front runners shift during the final hours of counting ballots, which is some reason why people naturally distrust the results because they're like, hey, my person was up right until you know, the 11th hour and then it changed. But many states have different ways of adding, let's say mail-in votes or um, international votes or, or whatnot to the count right at the end, which uh, can help people understand why a race might shift and there's no, nothing uh, wrong with that and there's no foul play. Uh, they should expect to see people believing a big lie and maybe to be lingering at polls to supervise and maybe you can share what you can do about that. Um, another example here is why and when we call races and you might not know the winner on election day. We were very happy to see that in 2020 a lot of newsrooms prepared the public that we might not know the answer immediately to all the races and even the presidential race so that people didn't think there was something bad going on but they explained exactly why you wouldn't see it and that that is okay. 
Um, lastly, expect that even if a candidate wins in a landslide, some losers are going to demand a recount and who's going to pay for that recount. So letting them know what the consequences are of people um, having false claims of voter fraud and tampering and what that means for them personally. So these are just a few examples, there's thousands more, but thinking about how you can prepare people for what we are likely to see. Um, another example, we really appreciate what WITF has been doing in Pennsylvania. They have been very bold and very, um, just very vocal about what they are doing and why. So they are clear in their stories about false claims, our attacks on the truth, on democracy. They are what we would say on the very um, far end of the spectrum of being pro-democracy and unapologetically so. Um, some other examples are partners at Trusting News, which if you don't know Trusting News, they do incredible work helping newsrooms be more transparent and, and basically help the public better understand how journalism is made and how newsrooms make decisions. Because in the absence of information, people will make up a narrative to fill in the blanks as to why you covered this candidate and not another, or why your newsroom decides to do X instead of Y. If you get out in front of that and state for the record, what let's say your mission is for elections coverage or what we're going to do when candidates come to town, who we will not cover, who we will, and you know what our resources are in the newsroom and where we have limitations. These sorts of things can really help you to let your audiences know and your communities know what you're able to do and what you're not able to do and where you're putting your energy. And it becomes an easy way if someone is criticizing you to say, we're on the record, this is what we're able to do. I'm sorry, we can't do everything. Um, we have seen a lot of newsrooms do great work recently in publishing a mission statement about their elections coverage to not just do the same old you know, horse race coverage or treating the election as an event with winners and losers, but to really think about what their goals are in their coverage and how that um, cascades down into decision making. So Trusting News has a ton of amazing examples on their website of mission statements, FAQs, they create really great landing pages around elections coverage, a lot of newsrooms do, that gives folks all the information they need to not only understand what's at stake, who's running, but how the newsroom is covering their work. Because if you don't have those conversations in your newsroom, you're very likely to just go by muscle memory and do the same old thing you've done in previous years, which I think you're all here because you realize that doesn't cut it anymore in this context and changes need to be made. So now I would like to throw it to my colleague Jessel at the Solutions Journalism Network to share more about Solutions Journalism and some examples of stories that could inspire you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessel Noor. I'm a journalist and the Democracy Initiative Manager at Solutions Journalism Network. Um, at Solutions Journalism, we believe that if journalists just focus on problems, we don't tell the whole story. We also need to focus on how people are responding, whether it's locally, nationally, or elsewhere. Um, our mission is to ensure the public has access to news that helps them envision and build a more equitable and sustainable world and gives them the tools to do so. Solutions Journalism is not good news. It's not hero worship. It's not about individual efforts. Rigor is central. Solutions journal journalism is evidence based. It interrogates efforts to solve problems. Um, you know, as we all know, there are no perfect solutions. Every solution has a limitation. But if it's but if it's, if a response to a social problem is moving the needle, then that's worth examining. Um, if you're looking for inspiration, I will share a link to our story tracker. Um, we have over 13,000 stories in our story tracker produced by 6,000 journalists at 1,700 news organizations. Um, and I'm happy to um, follow up with you as well if you have questions or resources. Um, and I wanted to go through some examples of some good solution stories that hopefully can um, inspire you or your newsroom. Um, WBEZ Chicago did a story um, in you know, the fall of 2020 um, at a time when it was really hard to go register and vote. And they did a story about how clinics and hospitals are stepping up to help to ensure um, voters had um, an ability to register. Um, by the time uh, that story was printed in October, over 40,000 patients had had, had um, gotten assistance um, in registering to vote. Um, these were new voters. Um, we have a... Um, uh, story. Um, uh, and so these are, you know, print, broadcast, radio. We have an article, uh, sorry, a video from a PBS affiliate in New Mexico about a, a mobile voting unit um, that, you know, uh, during the, that before the pandemic helped reach, you know, hard to reach communities to help them register to vote. 
they averaged about 110 voters a day. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for story ideas um, in your community, if they're fa facing voter registration problems, that's something that you could follow up on and look at. Um, you know, and there's, you know, we've we've seen the record turnout in communities of color and Asian communities in many states. And so uh, the story from the Texas Tribune um, helped examine how that was happening in Harris County. Um, you know, having access to translators, if if if, if citizens you know, can't um, access voting information is going to be really, that's going to be a challenge to voting. And so access to translators can make a huge difference. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so here's another story from Scalawag looking at um, how young activists in Mississippi are fighting uh, voter suppression and other obstacles to voting. Um, and you know, an, uh, a program led by young people. They found that over 350,000 eligible voters had not not yet registered. They figured out what, what they wanted to do about it. And um, you know, when the article was published in April, they had um, registered had re-registered over 30,000 voters to date. And they found they continued to engage the electorate by six percent higher every election cycle. Um, and um, yeah, so. You know, there's a lot of solution stories out there, um, and I'll put my email in the in the chat. Um, you can reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to connect you with stories, to give you feedback, help you brainstorm. I'm a resource, and um, you know, please take advantage of that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessel. Um, I will say too, another way that you can help people participate in democracy is by explaining how people are doing this kind of work of getting people to sign up and how you can be involved, et cetera. So I love that there's um, on the right hand side, you can see this little pull out uh, sidebar of like how they did it, what their focus is, et cetera. So as much as you can translate the stories of people working on behalf of democracy or, or doing these solutions orientations to help others understand how it works, what the mechanics are, how they can be involved, the better. So I'll just share one more um, solutions journalism story uh, just taking great ideas from other places. I love that the Philadelphia Citizen has ideas we should steal. That's a whole section. And so it takes inspiration from places and people that are doing something interesting that folks are saying, hey, why don't you do this here where we live? There's a way to do it. So I want to just share a handful more uh, examples for uh, inspiration here. Um, one is around boosting credibility. You can use your Democracy Day uh, reporting to show how the transition of power works and what happens behind the scenes so that people understand uh, what's the norm, what's the culture, what's the law, and what they should expect to see um, after an election is finished. Also, how-to guides are so important. So really user guides for participating in elections. There's a couple of examples here from KCUR, from LAist, from Atlanta Civic Circle, really thinking about if I'm a person and I'm confused about voting, what is all the information I need to make sure I can register, where I go, who's on the ballot, et cetera. So really thinking about how do you make your newsroom a one-stop shop for people who are ready to vote, maybe ready to vote for the first time. We're just thinking about voting the night before and saying, oh crap, how do I do that again? Um, really important to have these user guides if you don't already. And this can be part of your democracy day work as well as building out um, a one-stop shop for voters in your communities. Other things to consider is humanizing stories about new citizens and how they're able to join US democracy. As many of you probably know, there is a big myth going around in terms of how uh, you know, certain people are bringing in folks illegally to vote and who aren't necessarily Americans. Uh, that is false, that is not the case. And you can start to show how people who are new to the country or new citizens are um, basically part of this democracy, what they are offering it, how they had to jump through a lot of hoops to be part of it and, and what that process is like to help make sure that these uh, particular Americans are not dehumanized and again, prone to violence. Um, we know one major thing is that we're all really afraid of at the end of the day is that political violence is one of the quickest ways to lose a democracy because people want law and order right away because they are so scared when political violence erupts. And one of the quickest ways toward political violence is in just dehumanization over time of people, individuals, groups, demographics. And so whatever reporting you can do to make sure you are humanizing, making folks um, relatable and highlighting different members of your community and what they bring to democracy is really important. 
Um, you can also think about inviting editorials, opinion columns, community sourced pieces of personal stories on democracy. So allow the public to tell you and tell their neighbors why democracy is important to them, what it means to them. So an example from the Door County Pulse, a small newsroom in Wisconsin, uh, someone writing about why democracy matters from their point of view. So it's a way of not just saying, don't believe us, the newsroom, but you know, this is what your neighbors think about it as well. Cal Matters does great guides and a lot of great uh, guest commentary as well. Um, and then explain how to get involved in local politics and elections, if that is something that your newsroom is down to do, not just say, hey, here's how to vote, but here's how to get more involved. So a great example here uh, from the Livingston Daily is if you're skeptical of election integrity, here's how you can get involved. And they do a really great explainer with officials to say, these poll workers are your neighbors. These are people that you know, these are you know, folks in your community and here's how you can be involved. Um, the AVL Today did a really great piece I love their emojis, very user-friendly, as to all the different task forces and committees that people can join in their community. So beyond an election, what are other ways people can contribute, can take part in democratic processes and understand how things work? Also in terms of humanizing, uh, we do know that public um, officials and local officials who are working on behalf of conducting elections are our targets right now. And so as much as you can also humanize the folks who are behind the scenes, doing the work of making sure elections are done with integrity, are highlighted, are spotlighted, are celebrated, are get to explain what it's like for them, and you're able to share out uh, more about who's doing this work in your community so it doesn't remain abstracted. And I also just want to give a vote for actually democratizing your own newsroom. <laughs> you know, how do you think about how your newsroom reflects the processes of representing the people that you are covering as well? Newsrooms are not, you know, mandated to have representation in that way, but I think um, we can all agree that most newsrooms don't demographically represent the people that they're trying to serve. And by creating opportunities for engagement and listening and responding to people, you start to get closer to really making content that serves the needs of the individuals and their idiosyncrasies and their specific needs that you might not otherwise if you're just taking ideas from inside the house, so to speak. So the citizen's agenda, which is um, a, a process and a concept that Jay Rosen has been talking about for decades, and we have so much information on that, uh, we've created actually a guide walking you through step-by-step -step of how to do the citizen's agenda. Um, my company, Harkin, we provide technology and training for newsrooms who wanna do engaged elections approaches. So there's lots of different ways outside of these you know, approaches that you can be listening to your audience about what coverage they need as they head to the polls in order to make the best decisions they can on behalf of themselves or families and communities. And lastly, I just wanted to say that journalism is good for democracy. Michael mentioned this, Jay mentioned this in their opening remarks. And your audience might not understand exactly the role that journalism plays in democracy. This is um, information from our partners at Trusting News who do a lot of great research on this and who have you know, pulled from other research, but that erosion in local news is tied to a drop in civic engagement. And that reading a newspaper encourages and motivates people to vote. And that shrinking news coverage is tied to less competition in political races. So use this as a moment to tell people that your newsroom is actually required for democracy to function or that newsrooms and more news is something that is part of the solution here. So I love, this is an example um, from the Coloradoan where uh, their reporters on their bio pages and in some of their newsletters are saying, I believe in democracy, here's what I do. Here's how you can help our newsroom continue to support democracy and what's at stake there. So don't be shy to, to really turn the spotlight on yourself and how your news organization fits because people don't naturally or obviously understand how that works necessarily. So really making that transparent can be extremely useful. So I wanted to um, kick it over to Rachel for a few last slides here. There's some great opportunities here we wanted to share with you and then we will open it up to any questions that folks have. Yeah, so um, we um, are aware of at least one grant opportunity specific to democracy related reporting that's happening now through the Fund for Investigative Journalism. Um, so we'll pop the link uh, in the chat there. Um, they are offering up to $10,000 per newsroom and you can apply anytime they're taking rolling applications. Um, so this is a great opportunity if um, you're looking for some added capacity um, to apply um, as soon as you can for that. Um, and if we can move on to the next one. So we've been um, 
planning this basically since January and pulling things together and we sort of officially launched um, the project at the Collaborative Journalism Summit in May. Um, so we are in the process now of recruiting newsrooms to join. Um, and we already have all of our guidance and outlines for participation ready to go. They are on the website. Um, but we will also be following up uh, with newsrooms um, as we get closer to September about um, what to prepare for and what we'll need. Um, and then, as we mentioned many times, it's on September 15th. It's coming up sooner than you think. Um, and then we are hoping to gather what we learned through this experience so we can repeat it again um, in the next two years. Um, so. Uh, just a little bit about who is involved in sort of the organizer capacity. There's uh, about four of us, um, myself and Jen, in addition to uh, Stephanie Murray, uh, who's the director for the Center for Cooperative Media, and uh, Bridget Thorson, um, who I think is on vacation today, uh, who's the member collaborations editor at INN. Um, so we, we've just been the ones who've been sort of cooking it up um, in the first half of the year. And we have been very, very happy uh, to bring on an organizing committee um, that we've been meeting with on a regular basis um, from newsrooms around the country and other organizations that have been helping us, uh, helped us come up with this menu of options that we have on the website and other um, planning that we've been working on. So this has been a big group effort. Um, we have not been successful in getting funding for this year. So we've all been doing it in our spare time and through this network of wonderful people. Um, so we are very open to obviously funding, but also more uh, members of our organizing committee I believe we meet again next Monday. Um, and also, obviously, our big, big priority right now is recruiting newsrooms to participate for September 15th. So obviously, if you're on this call and you're interested, we encourage you to sign up. But we also encourage you to spread the word um, and help us recruit other newsrooms. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, we are at the end of the hour here. we got about 10 more minutes, and we'd love to hear from you. What questions do you have? Are there other types of stories you want to share out with folks that are here for inspiration? Is there any help we could be for your newsroom to take part in this? I know not all folks who are here on behalf of their newsrooms uh, maybe are confident that their boss will be down for participating in this. So we're here to support you in whatever way uh, we can. So we will open the floor. If you have questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and share. You can also share in the chat and we will stick around to support. Hi, this is Carol King. Um, I actually was very excited and enthusiastic right from the very early stages of this. I jumped in in the beginning and um, and I was for a while I was emailing uh, with I think it was Stephanie, but I somehow missed the date for the first organizing meeting. And I'm wondering if there's a link that I can go and listen to a recording of it and be able to catch up and, and get more involved. Thank you so much, Carol, for letting us know. We'll follow up with you uh, via email and see what happened there. Uh, so yep, we are- I'll take gonna, care of that. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for letting us know. And thanks for being an early adopter here and, and a supporter of this work. And as Joe wrote in the chat, everyone here who registered, even if you um, are watching this on the repeat, you will get an email that has uh, the information um, along with this recording and the documentation. Thanks so much. And as um, Joe and Stephanie have shared out in the chat before, and we'll, we'll do it again is, please register, please uh, sign up as a partner. So if your newsroom is committed to doing this, um, that we can, we can keep track and we can log and we can share out links to your stories. Our hope is that, again, this is building the groundwork for efforts in 2023 and 2024. There's so much work to be done beyond an actual day of democracy, but from learning from one another of what newsrooms are trying, what they're learning, what kinds of coverage is actually helping to move the needle on people being able to be agents of their own future in the democracy. And um, this is just hopefully the beginning of a long-term uh, programmatic effort that we're, they're all gonna be part of. So please sign up to partner so we can track and uh, make sure we highlight your stories as well. And also, yes, we have um, a list of FAQs on the Democracy Day website. You can also use hashtag Democracy Day on any of the spots that you are 
uh, visiting LinkedIn, Twitter, etc., TikTok, all the kids, wherever they are. Um, excellent. So if I'm not seeing more questions coming in, I will say, invite you all to go about the rest of your Wednesday. And we're so, so Laura? grateful. Oh, Laura, Laura has a question. question. Thank you, Joe. Oh, that's actually Jordan using Laura's login, I think. <laughs> Sorry. I can pull in one more question, it, um, it, unless there's someone else. Oh, yeah. Um, jo well, Jordan, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll Sorry, that confused me for a second. I forgot I was using Laura's login. Um, yeah, so uh, as someone who's trying to work with multiple newsrooms mm -hmm. to provide more coverage, I, I see some, some friendly faces in North Carolina here. Um, how well... Uh, have y'all um, contacted, how well have y'all captured the group of newsrooms that would like to do um, some of this coverage but don't have the capacity to do on their own? That's a great question. And actually something we, we've talked about that if we did have funding, what we would do is probably commission um, a variety of reporters to do some reporting that could be used um, in various contexts. So it wouldn't just be specific to one state necessarily, but this could be op-eds, commentaries, um, explainers, et cetera, that could be um, you know, Creative Commons licensed and anyone could use if they don't have the capacity to, to create reporting um, by themselves. And um, yeah, that's great. Stephanie mentioned, we also have asked the Associated Press to consider making some of their content available nationwide too. Awesome, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, I'm looking at the uh, Democracy Day website um, and I see the, uh, the latest from our reporting partners. Are you interested in, in posting um, partner coverage that happens before September 15th? And if so, uh, how should we submit that for consideration? Great yeah, so question. I Joe, can answer that really briefly. Um, so yes, we absolutely are. We'll be happy to feature them on the website. Um, we have a form that I can share and I'll have it up on the website right now. Uh, right now, I basically have it uh, with like one sample post in there just as we were going over what the workflow would look like, but it'll be an Airtable form. Um, you submit it to us. We'll uh, make sure it's up on the site. We'll notify you when it's up there and we'll share it out as well. I will say one more thing. We also have a listserv, an email listserv for anybody to join. Um, so once you become a partner, once you sign up as a partner to participate, we'll, you'll get an invitation to join that uh, Google group slash email listserv. That's just, we found a really easy way for everybody. Anybody can send an email to a single email address and then the whole group will see it. And then everybody can respond if you're not familiar. So all this will be in the follow-up email as well. I have it already, my bullet points are stacked and ready to go. So uh, look out, look out for that. Jen, can I add one thing? Please do. Um, just listening to the presentation today and thinking through um, what's involved in becoming more pro-democracy, uh, the timing is really great for the, with this request because there's enough time between now and September to come up with your plan of what you're gonna do differently in your election coverage in 2022 and looking forward to 2024 and publish that as your contribution. That would be really interesting. I think it would be super effective. And I think if we had a broad range of news organizations that are committing to pro, sort of strengthened pro-democracy coverage and they all publish their statements about what they're planning to do at the same time. That's a real wave that I think could influence a lot of people who aren't on this call and maybe didn't even hear about Democracy Day to ask really tough questions about how we're going to do our journalism differently, given the threats to democracy that we see all around the country. And the potential for this to be a, a kind of breakthrough moment for the press is real. I will share, Jay, that this is exactly what we've been doing as part of our Democracy SOS and Election SOS programming, is asking every newsroom to come up with a mission statement that they feel comfortable sharing out with the public and going on the record of what their goals are and how they're doing things differently and why. So we have so many examples of that, and we'll make sure we yeah. put that up on the Democracy Day website for folks who want us to, who, who just want to get on the record and say, here's what we're not going to do anymore, or here's what we're going to do differently, and, and give people that um, that, that benefit of understanding why they might not be getting the coverage that they used to or why their coverage is different and appreciating the, the steps newsrooms are taking to protect democracy. 
yeah, and it's it's a good deadline because if you have this date when you need to do this, it kind of forces action within your own newsroom, gives you uh, you know a timeline, uh, and I just I just think there's a lot of potential to it. So. Well, Carol, I want to circle back to you. Was there another question? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think there's a, a great untapped uh, resource in freelancers um, who are very fired up about this, but may not be connected. And I'm wondering if we have um, anybody in the organizing committee that is working together, you know, to sort of see how we can reach out and find freelancers and bring them together and get them involved, and whether the best connecting point would be solutions journalism for that, the network, or if there are other organizations that might be like cable ready for freelancers to jump in. Wow, Carol, you are reading our minds as to what we had planned were this able to be like a bigger funded effort, because that's something I think we could build toward 2023 and 2024. Um, so thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, because there is so much we could do um, with freelancers, with having content that's available, with having workshops about how to create these mission statements, um, with supporting one another with really great examples, um, et cetera. There's a lot that can be done. And I, I think the freelancer point is very, very valuable. So thanks for bringing also, that up. Have you, have you looked at National Endowment for Democracy? Because I was on their webpage for a webinar the other day, and they seem to have funding available for different kinds of initiatives. I would definitely check it out. Great. Can you put the name in the chat again? Uh, or sure. NED, okay. National Endowment for Democracy. Okay, I'll, thank you. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. We're right at the top of the hour. We know folks have either lunch to eat or meetings to go to or stretch breaks to be had. So thank you for taking the time to be here. We hope that you participate in this, that you spread it to other newsrooms. If you have colleagues or folks that work in newsrooms, let them know about the opportunity. And we hope to have newsrooms in every state participating and see what we can do this year and build toward 2024.